when I say very slow rate, I mean, it only lost 90% of its person power. <laughs> That's very slow. Uh, it, you know, we, we'll see uh, the gold at, you know, $5,000, $10,000 at a very slow rate. If we see it at a very rapid rate, we'll see gold at the end of the decade, 50000 100000 With regards to the CBDC, do you have an anticipated timing, number one? Number two, do you expect citizenry pushback? Do you expect riots? Do you expect them to say, no, we're not doing this? And third, um, with the states that you've spoken with and are trying to educate, do you expect the states to actually stand up and put forth this type of um, response as you've just outlined? Well, number one, I, I think the time frame is fairly soon. There are 110 nations racing to see which one is going to be the first with a credible central bank digital currency. We ha have heard from the whistleblower at the BIS that this is moving forward rapidly. We know that the Fed now has been tested, and that's a big part of this. It's like a software on which this pro or, uh, operating system on which this program, central bank digital currency, will run. I do expect a number of people will argue with it, but if they implement it the sneaky way I expect them to, they're going to say it's optional. You don't have to use it, uh, but... The government has decided as a stimulus package, every American citizen who chooses to sign up is going to get a thousand dollars and and we'll put it in central bank digital currency. And everybody's going to sign up for it because they're going to say, well, why should I not get my thousand dollars? It'll be voluntary until it's mandatory, just like the vaccine was. The vaccine was a privilege. You, well, you happen to be in a special group, so you should get it or you're older or you have this illness and we're going to give you this privilege. I remember people blaming me and attacking me uh, on our show, I went out and talked about the vaccines and, and, and I warned that they weren't tested and I said some things and they said, yeah, that's because you're in that privileged class and you've gotten your vaccine and the rest of us haven't gotten. And I thought, what kind of idiot are you thinking that I've ran out, ran out and got the vaccine? No, I'm just giving you fair information and fair warning, but it was a privilege until it was a requirement. And that's what they'll do with central bank digital currency. And will there be a revolt? Well, it's designed to clamp down on revolt. It's designed, for, you know, January 6th, people burst into the Capitol and all that. Now, if you say that there was any semblance of election fraud, something that the Democrats said for, you know, 2016 over and over and over, if you say there was election fraud in 2020, you'll get silenced. You'll get cut off Facebook. You'll have friends and family reject you because you're an election denier and you're all this even though there's been a lot of proof that there were there was malfeasance in that election, like every other election, by the way. Did it change the outcome? I can't say that. I don't know. But every election has had malfeasance. But now we're afraid to look at it. If you question central bank digital currency, they will give you the electric shock that will be harsh enough that you probably won't go back and question it again. Yeah. Yeah, everything you're saying is accurate. So, Kevin, in your book, Pirate Money and the writings that you've done on Twitter and other places, uh, you've spoken about and written about the Great Reset. Um, you've probably have touched on it a little bit here in our conversation. In your analysis, what exactly is the Great Reset, and is it, it is it inevitable or is it avoidable? The, you know, the Great Reset is a conspiracy theory, right? It's a conspiracy theory. Anybody that says, except for Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, the world must have a Great Reset. I'm sorry to impersonate his accent, but that's what he sounds like. He sounds like a Bond villain. He looks like a Bond villain. And he tells us there's going to be a great reset. And then they describe it in their publications. I read a Forbes magazine article, someone from the WEF, who said the great reset is going to be an adjustment of the debt that we have. And it's going to be a movement towards what sounds an awful lot like central bank digital currencies. And it will be to a no ownership society where you will be happy you will own nothing and be happy, which, again, has been labeled a conspiracy theory, except it's on the World Economic Forum website. And you look at who attends the World Economic Forum, and it's the Bill Gates and the who's who of the world. And they say this is what's going to happen. By the year 2030, America will be one nation among many, but not a superpower uh, that will eat a whole lot less meat and will eat more bugs, uh, that, uh, that uh, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. You know, the founders gave us life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which is just locks life, liberty, property. 
right? So somehow they're trying to divorce property from the pursuit of happiness that our founders connected those two intimately. They're trying to separate them and say, no property and be happy. Why would you not be happy? Because you'll be so in debt up to your eyeballs that the only way out is to accept th what they're giving us, the shackles. I said in the book, shekels, which is a type of money, become shackles because it's central bank digital currency. I'm so happy they've taken the debt away from me. I don't own a car. I, I, I just get to use it. I don't own utensils. This is written up in Forbes magazine by someone from the World Economic Forum. I cook at home sometimes, she said, uh, but I don't do it often. When I do, I don't have utensils or the things at home, so I just order them and they're delivered to me and then I send them back. But I don't even own my home I, I because during the day it's an office for somebody else. I just sleep there at night. You own nothing and you're happy. And she said, I, I question the privacy sometimes. I wish I had a little more privacy, but I'm afraid to say anything because they're always watching. That is flat out what the World Economic Forum is predicting. That is their definition of a great reset, where we change from a capitalist, free market, liberty, individual liberty loving society, and we become a drone class of bees that work to the greater good for everybody else, which is essentially from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. It is Marxism with an elite at the top running everything. And oh, who are the elite? Oh, my goodness, they're the World Economic Forum. Well, so, you know, it sounds like a debt jubilee in a way. And also on the other side of the debt are people who make money off the debt. So it'll be interesting to see what kind of pushback, um, you know, happens if they try to implement something like that. But more than 100 years ago, investment banker J.P. Morgan famously said, gold is money and everything else is credit. Kevin, understanding that gold is money really changes everything for the person who does understand it. It brings freedom. Yet so many people today, they don't understand this fact and they don't own gold. In fact, less than one half of 1% own gold today or a gold asset. That's kind of scary when considering today's state of affairs and everything that we just spoke about and everything that can transpire over the next few years. Would you explain why gold is money and why it brings freedom? Yeah, well, gold has historically always been money. Biblically, it's money. You go back and read Genesis to Revelation. It talks about gold and silver as money. It mentions copper occasionally. It uses the term brass at some points. Uh, the widow put in two copper mites, but that's always the least of the money. And, and the lesser money is silver, but it's still money. And the real money is gold. It's just historically been gold. Gold is is made when two neutron stars collide. Gold is God's money, and and it's always been valued as precious. Uh, you know, the attributes of money uh, th that uh, a store of value, unit of exchange, a means of exchange, and unit of an account. Uh, gold can fit all of those. But like other money, you don't carry around many hundreds of dollars of bills to go pay your mortgage and show up at your at the mortgage lender and say, hey, here's my $4,000 mortgage. Here's four, you know, $40,000 bills and you hand them that. So you have money in forms that you can carry and you have money that you exchange electronically. What we intend by our pirate money legislation is to make gold money in terms of electronic transactions. The problem with doing that today is you can do it today right now you know you may have a gold debit card that you're offering certainly there are others that offer gold debit cards commercially but when you do that you buy your gold and then you go spend it and the net result is you pay a capital gains tax on it and and the government says hey you bought gold at eighteen hundred dollars an ounce you spent it twenty four hundred dollars an ounce therefore you owe me 30% of that, you know, that gain is gain and you have to pay 30% tax on that and they're taxing money. What we're proposing is to make gold money because it is money. So we're not actually making it money. We're just talking about making it useful, electronically transferable. Uh, it doesn't change the amount of gold available in the world. And people said, oh, no, we couldn't go to a gold monetary system. We absolutely couldn't. The supply of gold is limited. And I look at them and I say, so what you want is actually a limitless supply of money. Good. You've got that. Yeah. We're not talking about ending the Federal Reserve. We're not talking about making the paper dollars in your wallet, taking them away and, and stealing them. We're not talking about anything like that. We're just talking about 
using the gold that exists today and making it useful in transactions. And that benefits everyone except those who are benefiting from the paper money system. So since gold really retains purchasing power, the value, you know, th there's that old adage about how back a hundred plus years ago, you can buy a fine man suit with an ounce of gold, which would have been about $20 and 67 cents. And today at the roughly $2,300, you could buy, again, you could buy a fine men's suit. It has retained its value, but the dollar has not. It, you, you, required twenty dollars and sixty seven cents twenty of those dollars you required back then to buy a suit today you require twenty three hundred of those dollars so when it comes for, to a freedom perspective to give somebody freedom when they stay in the dollar system they're losing value every day every year it's going down as you talked about almost ninety percent just since nineteen seventy one but if they're if they put their savings or some of their savings in gold they have freedom because they're retaining their value. Am I, am I right? Okay. I'll just give you an illustration. This is a 1924, uh, gold piece, $20 gold piece. It's a beautiful piece. Imagine your, your great grandfather or your grandfather decided he's going to take $200 and set it aside for you. And he put 10 of these in an envelope and sealed it up a hundred years from now. I want my heirs to open that up and I want to give that to them as a gift. Or he took, and I've got here a federal reserve note, uh, from 1924 approximately, uh, here. And he, and he took, um, 10 of these and put it aside in an envelope and you open it up, you open this one up and you are thrilled. Oh my gosh, you've got $23,000 you can spend. You open this up and oh, great. Grandpa left me 200 bucks, right? It, that is the illustration. Another illustration I'll give you is, is, is a house. The amount of gold it took to buy a house in 1924, hundred years ago, will buy you a house and a half today. A minimum wage. You go back to 1964 and you, and you say minimum wage was like five silver quarters, a dollar and a quarter. Well, those five, five quarters today in today's term, if they're the silver ones, that's worth, you know, 25 bucks or something. I'll pay minimum wage for anybody. If you took those same five silver, same five quarters that were not silver, a dollar and a quarter won't buy you anything. So if I, you know, bottom line is gold and silver retain their value historically. They always have, they always will. And that's freedom. That's freedom. So from, from a price mechanism perspective and understanding that it is a view at purchasing power loss, how high do you see the price of gold and silver going over the remainder of the decade? Oh my gosh, it depends. If the dollar collapses, gold will, uh, gold is going to be worth what it's worth today for the remainder of the decade in purchasing power. The dollar is not. So the gold, how high do I think it'll go? It depends on how much the dollar goes down. That That's the unknown question. And, and if the dollar goes down at a very slow rate as it has over the last, you know, since 50 years, very slow, slow rate, you know, it, it, when I say very slow rate, I mean, it only lost 90% of its person power. That's very slow. Uh, it, you know, we, we'll see uh, the gold at, you know, five thousand, ten thousand dollars at a very slow rate. If we see it at a very rapid rate, we'll see gold at the end of the decade, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand. I don't know what it's going to be announced. And if you think it can happen, look what's happened at Bitcoin. What what are the keys that make Bitcoin valuable? Oh, it's limited in supply. There's only two values to Bitcoin. Lim it's a cool technology, by the way, really cool technology. But the real two values are its privacy. So that you don't really know who's got what uh, at any time. The public knows what's out there, but they don't know who's got it. So it's got the privacy ability and it's limited in supply. Well, gold can be the same thing. It's limited in supply. And if it's state based, the federal government doesn't monitor every single transaction. And when I say monitor every single transaction, they were looking at Bank of America bank account records for anyone who was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th of 2021 and they they look to see did you buy at cabela's 
you might be a terrorist because you went shopping at Cabela's. That's not a conspiracy theory, by the way. That was brought out in congressional testimony where people say, yeah, Bank of America did hand over bank account records and you could look at it. I think having gold is a protection against that and having gold is a protection against money losing value over the decade. Yeah, so I appreciate that, Kevin. As the gold and silver miners own and can produce the real currency that holds its purchasing power, that being gold and silver, are you bullish on the miners moving forward in the economic and fiscal environment that we're facing? Well, I'm very careful not to give investment advice, just just answer. But I'll, I'll tell you this, looking historically, uh, comparing gold and silver miners to the price of gold, um, it, it, they seem pretty cheap. Uh, I read articles of others who are making an analysis and they're saying, you know, mining companies are, are, are really making, going to be making lots of money, making lots of money and their stocks yet are not, have, have not appreciated the same price as gold. Now, I remember back in the, in the seventies, eighties and nineties, I've been in the stock market a long time with John Templeton and, and he would say things like this uh, on the early stages, you want to own gold miners uh, in a, in a price movement, upward movement. Uh, but you got to be careful that when they become flush, that they go build buildings, buy lots of equipment and spend, uh, increase their salaries and all of that. So he would see a cycle to that, uh, looking from a Templeton style perspective, I'd say we're very early in that kind of cycle. Yeah, I appreciate that. So in your book, Pirate Money, that we've been discussing, you state that American dollars have lost purchasing power, which we've talked about. Um, since 2000, inflation has made things 76% more expensive. And even since 2020, prices have gone up nearly 20%. But here's another perspective you state. Maybe the dollar has not lost value over 50 years. What? How can that be? Would you speak into that? When George Washington would speak of a dollar and there's, you know, there's this uh, uh, apocryphal story about he, he, he threw a dollar across the river and so forth. When he spoke of a dollar, he was referencing this. This is a Spanish milled dollar, 0.7734 troy ounces of fine silver. Uh, this one is uh, 1783. So this is one Washington could have owned and held. This is what he meant by a dollar. They chose that term, not farthing, not pound, not shilling, because they didn't want British money. They wanted Spanish money. The name dollar is a derivative from a German word, thaler, but the Spanish version of it was dollar. This is not lost purchasing power. The dirty green piece of paper that's got Washington's picture on it that he would hate, by the way, because it's unbacked paper money, that thing has lost money. So it depends on your perspective. Do you believe a green piece of paper with Washington's picture is a real dollar or do you believe this is a real dollar? In America, until the coinage act in the, in the late uh, 19th century happened, this was real money. And even in the coinage act, when they did it, they demanded that uh, people turn in their Spanish coins to be melted down and turned into, this is an 1886 United States dollar, $1 bill. This was real money. This has kept its value. This has not kept its value. Or I mean, the paper dollar is not kept right. its value. Right, yeah, no, I understood what you said. Yeah. Well, this has, been, this has been a fascinating discussion and an important discussion. I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, the economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all of the expert interviews that we conduct just like this one. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled... If you don't own gold, you know neither history nor economics. It's a free gift. It's a must read for everyone on why we all need to own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive that free gift on us. Also, I'm positive that you've enjoyed this conversation with Kevin as much as I have. Please let him know. Hit the like and subscribe button and leave a comment below the video here. Kevin, in wrapping up our discussion, I know that you're not giving financial advice. My final question to you, though, is about positioning and really wanting to know, and for the audience's sake, what assets right now do you like and what assets do you absolutely 
recommend that we stay away from in light of all the, um, the discussions that we've had today? Well, the asset that I would be most concerned about if we see rising interest rates, and I'm not guaranteeing it, I'm not predicting it, I'm not recommending it, would be uh, bonds. Bonds would be an asset you don't want to own when interest rates are rising. Uh, what you do want to own, apart from real money, which is gold and silver, uh, you need to look at the stock market, not because it is a stock market, it is instead a market of stocks. And there are there are always opportunities. Jim Cramer says that you know, there's always a bull market somewhere. So you could look at the stock market, but you need good professional advice because what was good last year may not be good this year. The dogs of the Dow theory and all of that. So you should look at that. Real estate tends to do well in inflationary periods. Maybe not commercial real estate if we're going to go into an economic downturn. So all of those things, I wrote a whole book called Game Plan that basically says, depending on what the market and the economy hand you, you need a game plan to hand back. You need to go back with that game plan. And then I would recommend one of the best investments you can make is $17.87, which is the year that the Constitution was, uh, was implemented, 1787. And that's the price of a copy of the book Pirate Money. And you can get a copy of that at piratemoneybook.com. You can get it at Amazon. I do think it will tell you the history of money. It will give you a perspective that allows you to understand what is being done in the world against us and a way of escape that the founders gave us. So I recommend people look at the book Pirate Money. And certainly, I appreciated, Gary, the, the time you've given me to explain my perspective. You, you have a wonderful show, great questions, uh, and, and I heartily recommend people uh, to listen. If you've got guests that are, are tremendous, like I've seen, th this would be another recommendation I make. Follow uh, Gary and his, his podcast. Well, you're too kind. And I have um, perused through your book. Um, in leading up to our discussion. And it is an eye-opening, amazing read. I really highly recommend everyone get Pirate Money. I'm going to put the picture of it and the link down below so everyone can find it. Uh, Kevin, thank you for coming on to Metals and Miners and for being really generous with your time, your analysis and, and ideas. It's been incredible to spend this time with you. Would you share with the viewers any final thoughts that you want to leave with those tuning in, where they could learn more about your work, and how they can connect with you. Yeah, so uh, you can learn about it. We have a show on Blaze Television and other places that you can learn about at economicwarroom.com. Uh, and we have a new radio show that we've launched. It's a weekly radio show on American Family Radio. It's called Pirate Money Radio. It's 10 a.m. Central time on Saturday morning, so adjust for your time zone. Uh, and and transactionalgold.com is the third website I'll recommend to you uh, because that's where you can go and see where, whether or not your state is active in making gold and silver money. And we have 25 states working it now, and we're very excited that in the next 12 months, we'll get it passed in one or more states where you could actually put money, real money on deposit and spend it as you need it and hold it in the form of gold and silver. And you're also on Twitter. Uh, Twitter is uh, at Economic War Room or at Secret Weapon USA. Wonderful. So I'm going to put all of that information up there for you guys. Please go visit Kevin. Listen to what he has to share. Um, these are some very critical times and we need some some guideposts as we're get, going through it. And Kevin is one of those. So I look forward to having you back on sometime in the future, Kevin. Thank you for being here with us and everybody else. Thank you for watching. I want to point everyone over to our Substack. It's free. Go to metalsandminers.substack.com. We post free content on the consumer, the economy, markets, artificial intelligence, individual metals and miners, and all of the expert interviews that we conduct just like this one. And when you subscribe, we want to give you a free gift. It's a report that we wrote. It's based on the important Ray Dalio foundational premise. It's titled, If You Don't Own Gold, you know neither history nor economics. It's a free gift. It's a must read for everyone on why we all need to own gold. So head over to metalsandminers.substack.com, put in your email address to subscribe and receive that free gift on us.